All right, I am not <clears throat> I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that some people take the ending of Mark at chapter 16 verse 8 as a as a way of arguing against the truth of Christianity. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say this and there are some Christian even scholars who who do this and I think it's very damaging and unhealthy for us and there's also some uh atheists who do it as well like richard carrier stuff like that so we're going to get into all this stuff in great detail today we're going to we're going to deal with like bad objections to <laughs> mark 16 8 as well as some more some more smart objections ones that are more thoughtful but i still think fail because i do think mark originally ended at verse 8 let me just show you what i mean if you haven't been with me the past few weeks it's okay today will be i'll give you enough data that today's video will stand by its own but this is Verse 8 in Mark 16, this is the last verse, most likely, I believe, in the original writing of the Gospel of Mark, verses 9 through 20 I talked about last week, and you can check that out. There's a playlist link down below to the entire Mark series. Anyway, here we are. Verse 8, they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, this has obviously grabbed people as a strange way to end the Gospel of Mark, right? Like, you read it and you go... I was not expecting it to end quite right there, you know, um, and it, it does seem a little strange. I think that when I explain it to you today with a lot of context and a lot of work that has gone into this, that you'll go, oh, actually, that makes total sense. I get it. It's kind of a powerful and heavy and meaningful ending that does apply directly and powerfully into our lives. In this, the final video of the Mark series, that's right, I've taught... 70, including today, 70 studies through the Gospel of Mark. This is the last one. They're all available totally free, as well as my notes for almost all of the studies. I, ne I never say this, but you can actually go to BibleThinker.org, my website, for free. You can see the videos for free. You can get the notes if you want to check those out. I often will try to include footnotes. I'm getting better and better at that, including footnotes and links for those who are like, you're the researchers. You're like, oh, I want to read that article. I want to read that book. I want to check that source. I'm trying to get better and better at doing that for you. And... Here we go. Listen to these. These are the seven objections to the Gospel of Mark at verse 8. We're going to work through these one at a time, but I want you to hear them all at the opening. Number one, people say Mark can't end this way because it means there's no resurrection in the Gospel of Mark. There's no resurrection in the Gospel of Mark. I most commonly hear this from Atheists Online. Atheists Online, by the way, I don't, I don't despise you. Your representatives online, though, tend to be some of the most clumsy people in dealing with religious topics. And so we're going to we're going to tackle that issue. Um, it means there's no resurrection in Mark. The second objection is that this means that the women never told anybody, right? Verse 8, they never told anyone. They told said nothing to anyone. And so it's like this mysterious like it ends and no one has ever told that Jesus has risen, that the, the tomb is empty, the angel has sent them out with a message and they never tell anybody. The third objection is that, that um, it cannot end with the women in fear. In verse 8, it also says that they that trembling and astonishment had gripped them. They didn't say anything to anyone, for they were afraid. And this objection is that Mark can't end this way because they're in fear. I, I think that this fear is misunderstood, and this is very much a modern English problem when we're looking at an ancient text that uses fear in more ways than we do. And then number four, an ancient writer would never end a book with the word gar. Okay, gar is the Greek word, the last word in the sentence. And there, this is the more smart objection to the Gospel of Mark ending here. And the idea is, you know, you're just not going to end a book this way. It, the fact that the last word here is gar proves it's not really the ending of Mark. And the people who argue this way, some of them actually think that we've lost the original ending of Mark. So we'll, we'll talk about that and get into the details of that. Done lots of research on that topic as well, and I'll share it with you. Uh, number five, the fifth objection to the Gospel of Mark ending at verse 8 is that Mark ending on such a strange and sudden spot, it just doesn't fit ancient ways of ending a narrative. This is, this is, this is weird. Like, narratives don't end this way in the ancient world. It is, and the objection goes like this. It assumes that modern literary styles of sudden endings are used by ancient authors, and they're not. Or even worse, that it's a postmodernist reading of Mark. And this objection I heard all the time as I was studying this passage, looking at different people talk about it. They go, oh, if you think it is a verse 8, you're, you're assuming postmodernist, you know, you reader-supplied meaning. You, you, you read it and you don't ask what it means. You ask, what does it mean to you, right? Which <laughs> is not a good idea. Um, so we'll deal with that objection. Number six is this, that Mark's foreshadowing. Mark's foreshadowing earlier in the in the book of Mark, it shows us what Mark's original ending was going to be. And so they can some scholars have literally reconstructed, they've rewritten their own 
guess at what Mark would have had in his ending, which would include an appearance in Galilee. So we'll get to that. Like, is that evidence that the original ending of Mark was just lost? And I think no, but I will address that as the time comes. And then finally, number seven, the last objection is this. Mark or any gospel in your Bible, the four gospels, it can't properly end without appearances of Jesus being narrated, him appearing to the disciples and them seeing him risen. Um, that's the final objection. I'll deal with all of these today. Again, this is this is a strange way to end a book study. I got to fully admit to you, um, I'm just trying to tackle the issues as they come in the text. I don't want to miss out on the beautiful, powerful moments in the Gospel of Mark that it leaves us hanging with this deep and meaningful thing that we're supposed to carry away with us. This that, that brings us to our own trembling and astonishment. We'll talk about that later. I'm not going to miss out on that, but I want to tackle the issues as they are because sometimes I look at a passage of scripture and then I want to look at the world around us and go, where is the confusion? Where is the, the, the debate? And where's the fuzzy thinking here? And can we bring clarity so that we can come back to the scriptures simplistically and just read it for what it is? And that's kind of the process today. We're getting to restore that simplicity and the power that is in the original ending of Mark. All right, if you are, um, and before I jump into number one, just a quick announcement. If you're interested in how would I interpret verses 9 through 20, that's two weeks ago. If you're looking at um, why do I think Mark probably ended at verse 8, that was last week. And all of this stuff is available in a playlist down below. You can click the link down below, or you can go to BibleThinker.org and find the Mark series. It's all right there. Or you're on podcast, by the Bible Thinker podcast, or you could go to the app on your phone for Bible Thinker. Yeah, we have an app. It's all there. It's all free. Everything's free. We don't even have ads on any of that stuff on the website and stuff like that. So, all right. Number one, this means there's no resurrection in Mark. Um, this is the most common objection I've heard to the ending of gospel of the gospel of Mark at verse eight. It's I'll show it on your screen again. Again, verses nine through 20, probably added later. It may still be scripture. I'm not saying it's not scripture, but probably added later. The original ending would have been at verse eight. Um, <clears throat> so they go, hey, look, there's no resurrection. Like what you're missing in verses nine through 20 is He's, he appears to Mary, he appears to the two, he appears to, to the 11, right? And then he ascends and you're missing all this. So this to me is the most, just the most obnoxious objection to the end of the gospel of Mark. Yet, I, I kid you not, I've heard it on the lips of high profile scholars who are atheists or agnostics as uh, you, we can debate over terminology, but they... Um, they use this objection to the Gospel of Mark as kind of a shock and awe thing to do during a debate, right? Because you're just a sort of Christian showing up to the debate. I'm listening to this debate about God or about the resurrection. And this guy says, there's no resurrection in Mark. I didn't know that. And he says, Mark is my earliest gospel. So, so he's just, I've destroyed Christianity, you know. Um, this is horrible, this objection. It's, it's, it's almost just word games and tricks. Um, there is a resurrection of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Do I need to make this point? Yes, I do, and I will make it. Let me back up for you and show you Mark 8, 31. The first time Jesus predicts his death, he also predicts his resurrection. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, even if you don't think that the Bible is the word of God, you have to understand that in the knowledge of Mark, and in the awareness of his first readers, the resurrection is a fact. And that's why he can refer to it this way. Okay, so even if you don't have that 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 sort of respect for the word of God as, as it is, and that's just not, you're not aware of that, um, you've got to see the resurrection of Jesus is a historical claim being made in the Gospel of Mark. And it's not just in one place. Let me go to Mark 9, 31. Jesus predicts again. <clears throat> For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the son of man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Right? This is, this is, um, you know, either, either a, you, you believe the gospel of Mark is, is inspired by God, in which case you see Jesus predicting the fact of his resurrection, which did in fact happen, or, or you be don't hold that. You don't hold the resurrection of Jesus. You don't hold those things, but you at least can recognize Mark is teaching that it happened. Then again in um, Mark 10, 33 and 34. I, I, now you might be like, Mike, why are you laboring? This is like low hanging fruit that you're going after. But listen, these are the most common objections to the gospel of Mark that I've seen from guys like Richard Carrier, from, from people like, especially Bart Ehrman in debate. He often says things in debate that are just very misleading. Um, it's just the way it is. 
And we got to deal with the most common objections, not just the hardest ones, because we care about the people who are hearing these things. So in Mark uh, 10, 33 and 34, Jesus says, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and he will, uh, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. He will rise again. Now, let me point to you to, you, to the longest section at the ending of Mark. The ending of Mark, if, if, if it has the short ending at verse 8, which I believe it does. The ending of Mark isn't verse 8, really. It's 1540 through verse 8. So let's just go to that passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because it's a long section. We have a long study today already. But after the death of Christ, Jesus dies. The women are watching and they see Jesus being buried. Joseph of Arimathea comes and he buries him. And there they are. They're witnessing and watching the place where he is buried. That's their function here is as, as witnesses. I believe as eyewitnesses. That's why Mark includes their names and tracks them here. Then in verse 1 of chapter 16, that's it's the Sabbath is over. This is on the third day. They come. They bring spices. They come. The tomb is empty. Jesus has risen. He's not there. An angel proclaims. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Um, this is clearly early historical attestation to a group appearance of Jesus in Galilee to um, and, and to his empty tomb and to an angelic messenger telling you about his resurrection. What I'm suggesting here is that people who incessantly online will tell others, especially they do this to other atheists. I, they, I feel like um, atheists, if, if I could encourage you with something and I hope you know there's no weirdness or bitterness in my heart towards you at all. But I think that you are very skeptical of Christian leaders and, and apologists, but you tend to be very gullible towards atheist leaders and atheist apologists. And this is not equipping you with the, the, the healthy skepticism that you think you have. And I would encourage you to reflect on these things. You've, you've probably heard one of these guys say, there is no resurrection in Mark. And um, that was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, let's go to the second objection. But that means the women never told anyone. If verse eight ends that way, they said nothing to anyone, then that means the women never told anybody. And this is kind of one of those stories where you've got like um, uh, Mark knowing something that, that they never told any, anybody about. And so Mark somehow knows. He's like the omniscient narrator, right? He knows what happened in secret places where there were no witnesses. And <clears throat> that's really not how Mark writes. Mark's not writing fiction. He's writing just a simple practical, like this is what happened. This is when it happened. So he's not writing like that. He's not writing as the narrator who knows all things. No, instead, um, they had to tell somebody at some point, you know, it, it, it's not like a, a, that island, if you go there, there's a cave and inside the cave is, is, a, is a, a chest. And if you open the chest, you die. And everyone who's ever gone to the island dies. And then you're like, well, how'd you know about the cave and the chest? You know, it's just one of those, that doesn't work. What I'm, I'm pointing out here is that if you translate saying nothing to anyone, on into eternity, <laughs> then then you're, you're probably reading it far too strongly than Mark intended it. So how did Mark know about it and write it down? Um, but let me give you a couple other things. Does Mark, when he talks about silence, does Mark mean total silence? Or does he, does he use silence in a different way? So Mark 14 is an example of this. 61 and 62, we see him using silence in a very particular way. So there is silence, but it's a particular silence. Mark 14, 61, Jesus is being asked questions and it says by the high priest and it says he kept silent and did not answer. Uh, so he, he did not answer. You know, this is effectively similar to the women here. He doesn't answer. Now, if this skeptic who, who says this about verse eight or, or even Christians who say it because they go, it can't end at verse eight. If they take that same logic and apply it in verse 61, then Jesus would have had to have said nothing the entire time. But we've already talked about this a few weeks ago, how Jesus' silence was a particular silence. He just didn't say anything to defend himself. So in, in, in this, he keeps silent. And again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And now Jesus speaks. He's not silent. Jesus says, I am, and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
So in verse 61, he's silent and he doesn't answer. In 62, he answers. Now, some would try to pretend this is a contradiction. <laughs> uh, no, like you, you need to let the writer dictate his terms for what he means with words, right? And so obviously, Mark's aware of silence that is not eternal, <laughs> that has context. Um, in Mark 144, though, we come to the closest parallel, and I mean, it's very close, very close. You don't have to go outside the book of Mark to find this. The closest parallel to not saying anything to anyone. This is going to be really interesting. I, I, I love this. It, it feels to me sometimes like God has placed the answers to tough questions in the very text of the scriptures that we're, that we're debating over just for us to discover, right? Sometimes they feel like, oh, it's just for me to find, but it's for you and it's for all of us. The answers are right there. So here is the same phrase about saying nothing to anyone. Let's look at how it's used. So Jesus heals a leper, and after he heals him, he says to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. This is going to help us understand, what does Mark 16, 8 mean when it says the women said nothing to anyone? Well, what did Mark 16, or Mark 144 mean when Jesus told him to say nothing to anyone? Jesus' meaning is clear. Right? We have lots of context here. Say nothing to anyone on your way to go and show yourself to the high priest, which would involve language. Okay, the, Let me just set aside the idea, the hypothesis, that the man is going to mime. You know, when he gets to the high priest and he's going to be like, oh, I was a leper, but he cleansed me. You know, he's like two words. No, that's probably not going to happen. So um, he's going to talk to the high priest. His silence is very much all about while you're on your journey, to the high priests, say nothing to anyone. He's going to confirm that he's clean. And the high priest had a uh, spiritual as well as kind of a medical function here. They would declare, the priest would say, you are clean uh, legitimately so you can go interact in, in society normally at this point. So the man's going to be restored. Now with the high priest's official proclamation, he can go out and tell people what's happened. So he was to say nothing to anyone, but just go to the high priest. Now, obviously, Mark, not to mention Jesus, doesn't think that the phrase mean what skeptics take it to mean in verse 8. And context here is king. The meaning for the women is the same as the meaning for the guy here, the leper. In chapter 16, 8, let me just compare them for you here. They went out and fled from the tomb, trembling in astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone. This is the same Greek words, by the way. Uh, Udeni, uden, epan, that's what you have here in, in verse 8. Medeni, meden, epes, which is just uh, the same words within a different context. So like Jesus tells him, say nothing to anyone. And here it's, they said nothing to anyone. That's the only difference. But the, the root words are all identical. So the meaning for the women is like the meaning for the man. They said nothing to anyone on their way to do what? To tell the disciples everything they just experienced. That I think is the right and proper understanding of verse 8. The women are not forever silent. They're on a mission. They say nothing to anyone on their way to tell the disciples about the monumentous thing they just witnessed. That's the context of Mark. Now, there's more parallels that are super interesting. In Mark 1, Mark chapter 1, the man is commanded to speak to an intended audience. And he's to say nothing to anyone on the way there. In Mark 16, the women are commanded to speak to a specific audience, right? Not the priest this time, it's the disciples. And they say nothing to anyone on their way there. In Mark 1, with the man, the leper, the message is for the priests, and the priests have a special function. These parallels are really interesting here. The priests function as the ones who are like the spokesmen of the covenant, the covenant, the old covenant that God has. And they're speaking of the cleanness, the their goal, their, their, their job being used by Jesus, perhaps unaware, is to affirm that Jesus has in fact cleansed him from uncleanness that he's experienced, right? Now, they're the spokesmen for the covenant. They're the ones who can officially declare the man's clean. But in Mark chapter 16, the message is not for the priests, it's the apostles. And who are the, who are the apostles? They're the spokesmen of the new covenant. The apostles are the ones who will declare to the world, hey, Christ has accomplished the forgiveness of our sins. He's risen from the dead. And now they can go out and learn to say, hey, you're, you're clean. I'm going to proclaim to you, you're clean. Christ has made you clean. We will not call unclean what, what God has called clean. I think this is very powerful. The parallels from at the beginning and at the end of Mark are really neat. So that, to me, is just a beautiful thing. Um, there's more support for the fact that silence is limited 
and it's just on while they're on the way to go tell the disciples because let's look at the context again in verse seven they get a command and in verse eight it's their response to the command so go tell his disciples and peter he's going ahead of you to galilee there you will see him just as he told you so their whole command is to go and tell they're to carry a message to the disciples that's their job that's their goal that's the women's thing here and they do it what's interesting is that if mark intended verse 8 to be a contrast how some people read it some people say hey this is a contrast they were told to tell but they went and told nobody that's how they read this um i would expect it to say but they went out and fled from the tomb right because i want a contrast word i want verse 8 to tell me that it's in contrast to the command they received but instead the way it's written it feels like they're fulfilling the command they they went out and fled it's just he says this and they went out and fled there's no contrast here it's a continuance so that in light of the use of silence in mark of the phrase nothing to anyone of the fact that mark even writes of what they're doing and the fact that we have other accounts that tell of the women uh, in fact getting the message to the disciples I think this objection's really bad. But also, um, 16.8, this is super important. I'll, I'll just mention it briefly, but it's a really big deal. In these debates, especially the, the, the more low-hanging fruit discussions about Mark, which are most of the discussions, let's be honest, um, people talk about it like verse 8 just is the ending of Mark. And this is when skeptics come in there and they're like, oh, well, you know, they're in silence, they're in fear. We'll talk about fear next. They're, uh, they, they say nothing to anyone. But notice what they've done is they've hyper-focused on verse 8. They've pulled it out of the context of the rest of Mark. They're taking a verse out of context. Verse 8, here's my point. Verse 8's not really the ending of Mark, is it? The ending of a book isn't the last sentence. It's going to be like the last chapter, the last paragraph, maybe probably a couple paragraphs. In Mark, the ending is not verse 8. The ending is much bigger than verse 8. So when you have a sudden ending at verse 8, it ends there, but it's not the whole ending. What you do is you stop and you look back. If you've ever read a book where you're like, boy, it just ended quickly. You then look back and you, you go to the past few pages to make sure you didn't miss anything. Did I miss some clues? Did I miss some important point? This is kind of the natural thing that we do. If a movie ends suddenly and unexpectedly, you stop and you, you have to rethink all the scenes leading up to the ending. This is what Mark does to you. He causes you to go back and reflect upon the death and the resurrection of Christ and that is his big focus this is this is a big deal so the mistake that some people make forgive me if, if I labor this point just a little bit the mistake some people make in the gospel of Mark when they want to criticize or um, even worse try to try to use the verse 8 ending as ammo against Christianity um, it's terribly irrational in my opinion but when they want to do this the the problem they do is they they look at the last sentence and they draw a line forward to project the future from the last sentence instead of looking at the ending of Mark, which is bigger than one sentence. I mean, it's at least verses one through eight, if you're going to call that the end. And then you draw the line forward. Oh, Christ is risen and the message is going out about his resurrection. He's going to meet them in Galilee. That's how it ends. That being said, that means Jesus' resurrection is predicted. His resurrection is accomplished. It's an instruction to tell the disciples a flight in fear, which in context is not total silence. It's not an evil fear. We'll get there. And an expected meeting in Galilee. The line we draw as we project forward, what happened next according to Mark's gospel, is the same as the other gospels. So the, um, the next objection is this, number three. Number three, they say that Mark 16, 8 has the women in fear, and it really can't end with them in fear. Okay, these are all things, in, especially in verse 8, where you just go, it's got to have more, right? Well, we've looked at how they're saying nothing to anyone is, in context, totally fitting, right? They're, they're on mission to the disciples. They say nothing on the way there. The, um, the fear, though, I think strikes us sort of uniquely. And, and let me explain why I think this is a problem for you and for me in our modern culture. We use the word fear and the concept of fear in different ways than they did in scripture and as many people have done throughout time like i feel like we're just weird with the word fear we tend to think of fear as like horror movies fear as um uh, unhealthy generally speaking fear we typically think of it as being an unhealthy thing right fear is a bad thing 
that's not the way that they viewed fear, even a hundred years ago, that people were talking about fear. So back in Mark's time, certainly in scripture in general, fear is seen as a positive thing and a negative thing. It's, it's a two-sided coin. Fear of the Lord is very good. Fear of man is bad. Why is fear of God good? People hear this and they think, oh, so I should be terrified of God? Like at any moment, he may just strike me for no reason. You're like, no, you, you, just, you just have a very modern vision of fear and you're not understanding the, the, the larger scope of its meaning when you look at um, its use in other places outside your junior high. <laughs> so uh, so we got we to go a little bit bigger than that. So what did Mark mean? What kind of fear is he talking about in verse 8? I'll put it on your screen again for you. They said nothing. Why did they say nothing? They're afraid. They're afraid, right? And perhaps that they're afraid is commentary on the whole on the whole thing, right? Because they see the empty tomb. They meet an angel. They get the message of the resurrection. And they are in fear. I think this is a good fear, a healthy fear, a positive fear. And it's one that you should have too. Let me explain. So first off, to help us out with context, to show that Mark is not somehow different than the other Gospels or conflicting conflicting with the other Gospels, we have Matthew 28. Because Matthew 28 actually gives us a, a statement about the same women in the same moment and that they're in fear. But he gives you other words that help, at least for English, modern English readers, help you understand the context. So Matthew 28, 8, they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. You don't, now, see, this is a perfect example because in English, we don't combine fear and joy. <laughs> this is like not what you combine because we tend to have a very negative connotation of fear. Fear is terror. Fear is um, a negative and bad thing. But here, it's not. It's Fear is like considered a healthy thing. Fear is a proper response to something that powerful and amazing that God has done. Fear is about letting the weight of the moment hit you fully until you are just shaken. That's not a bad thing. So that, that would be in, in Matthew. Now, the word here is phobu, which is going to be the same as the, the word we see in Mark. So it really is the same thing he's talking about. Ah, so you start to get the idea. Mark, just because he says fear, he doesn't mean what maybe you're thinking he means. Um, Larry Hurtado, who's a, a scholar who's written on, well, a lot of stuff. Well, well-respected guy. He says the following. Um, Trembling and bewilderment and afraid, in verse 8 of Mark 16, he says similar language elsewhere in Mark describes human reaction to wondrous event, to a wondrous event, a miracle or revelation of divine power. And he mentions several verses, 212, 542, 441, 515, 533, and 96. I'm going to go through specific verses, but um, when Mark uses the word fabas or fabu, when he uses the word fear here, fabas is like the lexical form. This is not important that you remember that, but you do you do realize the name. It sounds kind of like phobia. Yeah. <laughs> Although it doesn't mean the modern, the same thing as the modern word phobia. That's a mistake a lot of people make here. But when Mark uses the term, as what Hurtado points out is, it's often not this negative thing. It's often a positive thing. It's a mixed bag. Sometimes it's very positive. Sometimes it's negative. It tends to be depending on um, who the fear is directed to. So 12 times in Mark, he uses the word fear or fabas. 12 times he uses the word. When he uses the term, he um, sometimes uses it in a very negative connotation. Like the Sadducees were afraid of the crowds. Okay, that's obviously a negative connotation. Fear of man, generally a bad idea, right? Um, other times, somebody's afraid in a different sense. Now, the times where it's used that's closest to Mark 16, 8, clues us in on why these women were scared. Like, what should I think about the fear of the women? Because Mark does focus on the response of the women to the resurrection. He, that's his final moment, right? He, he, he wants, I think, to focus on our response to the resurrection is, is how it applies to us. But we'll come back to that. So 12 times in Mark it's used. Here are some examples that are closest to the Mark 16, 8 usage, in my opinion. Mark 4, 41. This is when Jesus calms the storm. It says they became very much afraid and said to one another, who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you see how it's being used? Like we might read fear as just being terror here, but that's not how Mark's using it. They, um, they, they have like a kind of fear, right? 
And he's like, why are you afraid? There's, there's like, it's like I said, it's a two-sided coin. But after seeing Jesus do this miracle saying, hush, be still to the wind and boom, it becomes, it becomes calm. They have a different kind of fear. And this fear, this fear is not a fear of the storm. This fear is now shifted. This fear is a, a healthy fear of Jesus because it asks the question, right? Who is this? They're shocked by the moment, by the miracle moment Jesus has produced. And they go, who is he? This is the right kind of fear. This is the same kind of fear in 16.8, where they're shocked by the empty tomb, by the resurrection of Christ, by the angelic messenger, and they're shaking. Have you, have you ever experienced this where something so profound and powerful happened that it wasn't a bad thing, but you were shaking, your adrenaline's pumping, not just because you're scared in a bad way, but because you're impressed by the moment. You are deeply impacted by the, by the importance of, by the gravity of the situation. That's what's happening here in Mark 441. The gravity of the situation is nothing bad. Mark 515 gives us another example. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon possessed sitting down. So Jesus has cast the demon out of the demoniac, right? Clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion and they became frightened. Those who had seen it, um, oh, excuse me. Then they asked Jesus to leave, right? Um, but they became frightened. That's the same, same word. Now, here I want to be careful with how I interpret this and recommend that we consider that the fear was good, but what it was directed to was bad. So when they see the man, they see the, the manifestation of the power of Christ to heal this man and put him in his right mind, to cast the demons out and all that. They're blown away by it. They're impressed by it. They think it's powerful. They think it's moving. But they were, the reaction to that the fear is proper, right? Uh, wow, what does this mean that Jesus can do this? But then they ask him to leave. That was a bad response. This is this is the same like double-edged sword we get when we encounter Christ and the and the gospel. We can some sometimes we can be aware of the truth of it and we ask him to leave because we don't want him to change our lives. That would be the response here in Mark five fifteen. Then we have another example in Mark five thirty three. Um. This is going to be the passage where Jesus heals the woman with the with the issue of blood, right? So she's got this bleeding problem and Jesus, she's like, if I just touch the hem of his garment, she has a lot of faith and she touches and gets healed. And then Jesus, if you, you know, look up at the passage, Jesus talks about like, hey, who touched me? And she, she gets scared at this question. So the woman fearing and trembling, that sound familiar? Is verse eight, 16, eight, aware of what had happened to her came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth and he said daughter your faith has made you well go in peace and be healed of your affliction this is i think a healthy fear this fear again is not a fear of man it's not a fear of uh, losing control of your life you know no, no it's it's i'm so amazed by who jesus is that i will come down and just I, I, I give in, no manipulations no tactics just i yield to you christ i confess and he's like your faith has made you well. This is a beautiful fear. This is a healthy fear. It's a positive awareness of Jesus's power. So there's other examples in Mark, but they aren't similar in the sense that Mark is not, um, he's not using fear as a response to divine power. It's fear as a response to other things. And they're generally negative. But the times where it's a response to Jesus and his power, it's generally a positive thing. It's a proper thing. So the women are afraid. But they're not afraid of the crowds, like the Sadducees, or of Jesus doing things they don't want, like some other people were in the Gospels, uh, or in Mark's Gospel. They're in fear of the momentous thing that just happened. Like, they're literally physically shaking with it. That's what Mark 16, 8 says. They're in fear of the incredible meaning behind the miracle. Jesus rose from the dead. What does this mean? We have just come to the tomb to commemorate the death of Christ. And here we find that he has conquered death. What does it mean? What does it mean? And they go out with a message. That's how Mark ends. With them trembling with the awareness of the power of the resurrection of Christ. That is a good ending. There's only um, one other use of astonishment. It says they were trembling and astonishment had taken them. Well, that word astonishment or astounded, it's only used one other time in Mark. It's in Mark 542. I'll mention it in passing. Here it says, immediately the girl got up and began to walk. What girl? Well, this is the little girl who died. The little girl that Jesus raised from the dead. This is the only other raising of the dead we read in the gospel of Mark, right? And Jesus does it. He raises this little girl. She gets up and begins to walk for she was 12 years old. And they immediately, and immediately they were completely astounded. 
I like this because that's exactly the point. A resurrection astounds you. And that's that's their response. Okay, the women are not as some, and maybe some of you have never heard the skeptics, but like I encourage you to encounter with, you know, deal with people online, talk to them about your faith, and you will see that as you're presenting these things, objections will arise. And one of my goals is to help handle those objections as I do even verse by verse teaching. So that we might see more people go, wow, I, I didn't realize there were answers to those complaints or those objections. You know, maybe I'll maybe I'll stop and give a second thought to the gospel of Christ. So um interesting thing, another parallel I'll mention is that he tells the the, the people not to be afraid. Um this is when he's entering the room and he tells he tells the synagogue official, like, don't be afraid. That's super interesting. So earlier in Mark, the closest par- parallel to the resurrection itself is the par- is the raising of this of this little girl, um, and he's he's telling them, "Don't be afraid of what of death of the fact that your daughter has died. Only trust me. Only believe." This is part of the message of Mark. You don't have to be afraid of death, people. <laughs> Jesus has conquered death. What you should have proper healthy fear. The other side of the coin, that healthy fear is of the resurrection of Christ. And if you have a healthy reverence and fear of the resurrection, of the power of Christ, of the work of God through Jesus, you don't have to fear death. I think that's a beautiful illustration of how it's being used in the gospel. All right, so number four, number four. Um, here's the fourth complaint against a verse eight ending. An ancient writer would never end a book with the word gar. Okay, now we've, we're moving from three to four, we're moving from like um, what I would consider super common and very obviously bad objections to the gospel of Mark, uh, ending at verse eight and even to Christianity (laughs) to to think that it destroys Christianity. (laughs) That's what some people say. Um, but number four is going to be a thoughtful objection, a careful objection and one that takes a lot of work to really iron out. So I'm just going to give you, I'm going to dump it on you guys here. If you're not interested in the gar information, you're welcome to skip ahead. If you're watching the replay, those who, who join me live, uh, for a regular basis. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for joining. I look over here because that's where I have your live chat. Like, I can't read it while I'm teaching because I will no longer teach. All right, but number four, an ancient book, an ancient work, an ancient writer would never end with the word gar. So what's the word gar? Well, this is like a Greek word. It, in English, you should G-A-R, right? G-A-R, just a three-letter word, and it means four. It basically means the same as the English word for. It's what's called a post-positional particle, the way it appears here in verse 8, gar. It's so, so when verse 8 ends by saying for they were afraid, what you want to know about this to understand the objection, I'll put it on your screen, is these, these words, for they were afraid, these, um, this is just two words in Greek, right? It's they were afraid, ephabunta, and then gar is the word for. But the way it appears in the in the Greek, the word gar is last. Okay, word order in Greek is often different than in English, so that's not really, well, some people make a big deal about it. We'll talk about it. Let me bring you guys into this debate. Um, so it used to be that scholars, even the majority of scholars, about 100 years ago in the early 1900s, they said that sentences don't end in gar. Like in Greek, you just don't end a sentence with the word gar. It just doesn't happen. And it became a very popular view to the point where in 1913, uh, James Moffat, who made his own translation, he his translation of Mark 16, 8, actually read this way at the end of the translation, for they were afraid of dash. And then he didn't even finish the sentence. He's clearly trying to tell the readers of his translation that we've lost not just the ending of Mark, we've lost the rest of the sentence. So that's kind of a big deal to say that. Um, personally, uh, if, if, we've, if we had lost the ending of Mark, it just doesn't to me hurt or damage like my belief in scripture. I think that God is sovereign over what, what he keeps and what we have and don't have. There's lots where you could say we're missing, <laughs> but only missing if you think you're supposed to have something that maybe God doesn't want you to have. Um, so, you know, Paul had written many letters that don't appear in, in the Bible. Just the ones that God wants are there. There's, there's, there's obviously selectivity from the Holy Spirit on what we have of all that was written and said. Jesus said many things to the apostles that were never written down. And you go, like, we're missing all these statements of Jesus. We're like, no, this is just what God has for us. So personally, I, I wouldn't have a theological problem with that. I just think it's incorrect. So this view does persist, though. Back in the 1900s, early 1900s, it was there. But even as, as recently as 2008, a well-known scholar, Keith Elliott, has said it. 
Let me quote to you now from the book Perspectives. Um, this is what Eliot says about why you should think Mark never ended with verse 8 initially. He says, whatever the scribes allowed, albeit with hesitation, I conclude that no author would have chosen to end a piece of writing, sentence, paragraph, or even less a book with a postpositional particle. And so we must decide that originally a continuation of verse 8 existed alongside a possible Easter appearance until the final page of the original Gospel of Mark was irretrievably lost. So Eliot, he, he is a believer, but that's his view on this gospel. I, but this is, okay, I've read his quote. And I looked at it in, in context like I, I'm confused by this because what Eliot says and what, what is in many older scholars, and perhaps they're just borrowing from old information, it has been refuted soundly. So there are over 200 examples, over 200 examples in ancient Greek of a sentence ending in gar. Over 200 that's a pretty significant number. I'm going to share two of them with you that you're somewhat familiar with, even if you didn't know it. Okay, so one of them is John 13, 13. This is a sentence in your Bible that ends with gar. In English, Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. And there's the word for, that's gar. And then I am is amy. In the Greek, it's act the sentence ends amy gar or i guess you're you're like you're watching this way <laughs> we're on the other sides of these things here so um but it's gar is the last word of the sentence so what's it's just strange to me and I, i'm trying to understand why scholars thought like how did it become this thing <laughs> where they all believed maybe someone could explain this to me in the comments i don't know if you know how did they all think and yet we have a another passage in scripture where it has a greek sentence ending with gar now, there's another really interesting example from the Old Testament, and it's in Genesis 18.15. Now, let me anticipate an objection. Someone's going to say, Mike, Genesis was not written in Greek. You're right. It was not. But it was translated into Greek. And the New Testament authors had access to the Greek translations of the Old Testament. So, in the Greek, this phrase, this, there's two sentences in this verse. Let's look at the first one. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. A few things about this that we want to point out. Okay, this is where Sarah laughs at the announcement from, from God that, that there's going to be a, a baby. And she laughs and he's like, you laughed. And she goes, I didn't laugh, which makes all of us laugh that she's lying about laughing. But this sentence ends with gar. And not only does it end with gar, it ends with not just for, but she was afraid. It's, it's like the same two Greek words that occur in Mark 16, 8. Here's a sentence that's really close. I mean, the parallel's really strong. So um, in Greek, it's ephabunta gar, right? That's, that's Mark 16, 8, for they were afraid. Here it's for she was afraid, um, which I think, let me see if I know my notes. I think it was like ephabethe, um, uh, ephabethe gar. So it, which is just the difference between they were afraid and she was afraid, right? Just they and she, but it's the same words, afraid. Um, this is... Okay, if you've heard people say that sentences can't end with gar, like that, I don't know why anybody says that. So one scholar takes all this and he summarizes it and he says simply, if you can end a sentence this way, follow the logic here. If you can end a sentence this way, you can end a book this way. I am okay with closing the discussion there, but I won't because there's a lot more to talk about with gar. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you can end a sentence, how? why on earth can you not end a book that way? I feel like we're sort of looking back at scripture and coming up with these rules that don't really truly exist and sort of forcing them onto the Bible, which creates like, um, instead of us sitting underneath what's there, we're sort of standing above it. And that's like a dangerous position to be in. So I'm going to suggest this. Like if you can end a, if you can end a sentence with Gar, you can end a work with Gar. Okay. It doesn't seem like it's that hard. Imagine all the books you would you could open to that end with a strange word. The last sentence ends with a word you don't normally expect. And you don't just say, well, he didn't end that way and then walk away like that. That just seems really weird to me. But some have pushed back and they say, okay, um, we now know you can end Greek sentences with gar, but you would never end a book with gar or a work. You would never end an actual work with gar. Uh, most scholars used to think this was impossible. This was scholarly consensus at the time. There's been a huge change. Now most scholars think it is. One example is the 32nd treatise of Plotinus. Allow me to tell you very briefly 
about this work you probably don't care about, <laughs> but it relates to today. So um, the 32nd treatise of Plotinus ends with Gar. That's clear. Some people push back. Some scholars push back and they say, hey, and um, this is in um, one of the books I've been reading. Um, no, 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 not marking the end. That's different. This is in a, uh, a work I will link down below after the study. I will link it down below to an article. I'll, t I'll tell you about it in a second. But the 32nd treatise of Plotinus was probably, uh, or at least possibly, some scholars think it wasn't really the end of the work. Originally, there was like the 31st, 32nd, 33rd were all together. Okay, but here's the problem with that view. Um, Porphyry, if these scholars are right, Porphyry, Plotinus's pupil, is the guy that edited the work. He chopped it up. He published the 32nd treatise as the end. Okay, that's that means this. Here's all it means to us. Here's all we care about. At least Porphyry, an ancient Greek editor and student of Plotinus, he thought it was okay to end a work with the word gar. That, that matters to me. Okay, like, you know, here we have moderns saying ancients can't do that, and we have an ancient doing it. Um, another example of a work ending with a sentence that ends with gar is a guy named Musonius Rufus. He wrote a first century AD work, um, and he's a first, so he's a contemporary of Mark. He's alive when Mark's alive. And in his 12th tractate, he ends with the word gar. Now, I wanted to look these works up and read them, at least in English, to see kind of what they were about and stuff like that. I don't recommend you look up Musonius Rufus's work. It's inappropriate because humans have been making that kind of inappropriate stuff for many years. The point is, we got two works that end in Gar. So the pushback, the scholars, let's let's engage more in the debate, right? Scholars first said, sentences don't end that way. And some still echo that today. But we have many examples that do, even an example that looks just like Mark. Okay, so they go, but yeah, but works don't end that way. Well, here's at least two examples of works that do. Um, so then scholars push back and say, in fact, a guy named Clayton Croy, he wrote a book in 2003 called The Mutilation of Mark's Gospel. And his argument to follow up, to carry the debate forward says, hey, maybe books, maybe works can end with gar, but not narrative. Narrative is a genre where you're not going to see an ending in gar. And if you guys are like me, you're already starting to sniff that this argument is getting thinner and thinner and thinner against Mark 16.8. It just seems weird, like what you can write, philosophy can in that way, but not narrative. But that really is Clayton Croy's argument. Let me read it to you, and then we'll talk about another scholar who responded. What He says, what kinds of sentences end with gar? Such sentence, sentences occur most often in certain kinds of literature. Sentences ending in gar are much less common in narrative. And Clayton's Croy, uh, Clayton Croy, who, by the way, has the coolest name. Like, I feel like he either needs to be like a, a land baron, like in the south somewhere, or maybe like a crawfish farmer. But no, he's a scholar. At any rate, Clayton Croy, as I understand it, his argument goes like this. Mark is in the genre of narrative. Narrative is very unlikely to have gar as the ending of a sentence at all, let alone the book. Other genres have gar ending sentences a lot more. And his probably his chief genre here is philosophy. In Greek philosophy, we see gar ending sentences a lot more. So this is like just saying, hey, you know, when you're writing like a philosophy book versus a story book, like, you know, it just, you write it differently. All right, most of us at this point throw our hands up in the air. You and me both. We go, I, I, I don't have the capacity to study into all these issues, to know how to like figure out how frequently gar ends a sentence in ancient Greek narrative. Like, I don't have this ability. So we just have to take scholars' word for it. So then you you would quote Clayton Croy and be like, well, you know, Dr. Croy says this, and and so I, I conclude he's probably right. Fortunately for us, there's a guy named Kelly Iverson. Uh, Kelly Iverson analyzed Clayton Croy's argument in 2006, and he found some really big problems with it. So we're going to talk about that right now. He wrote the paper, and I will, like I said, this is the one I just mentioned. I'll link it below. It's called A Further Word on a Final Gar. It's not that long of a paper. It's like, I don't know, 15 pages or so. And the paper itself is very, um, it's pretty easy to follow, even if you're not a professional. Another book I used on, I'll talk about later is from uh, Lee Magnus, Marking the End. I don't even recommend you guys read it, to be honest. No offense to Lee. It's not written for normal people. And it requires a lot of, uh, just a, a lot more background knowledge and all that kind of thing. It's not super accessible. And um, and it's got some weird stuff in it too, as sometimes scholars do. But let me show you what, what he did. So um, Iverson says, hey, Croy's work is like about statistics, right? Like, how often does Gar appear in narrative? How often does it appear in philosophy? We're going to dig into that in detail right now. 
very briefly. It should take just a couple minutes. This is the first table he'll produce. And he's, he says, look, I, um, this is what's cool about what Iverson could do. You couldn't do this 20 years ago. You can do it now. Uh, what Iverson did was he used computer anal analysis, computer analysis of ancient Greek texts. See, we've got these texts. We've digitized them. Millions of words. And now he's doing computerized searches to find things that would have been so hard for scholars to find, having to read every work and check every little spot. So here's what he found. These are the numbers of times gar is used on your screen in ancient works from the 8th century BC to AD or uh, BCE to CE. I don't really care which, which terms you use here. But but this is, this is then sort of shrunk down and he just, you know, Iverson says, I'm going to focus on just the stuff that happened near the time of Mark. Third century BC to second century AD. And he finds a total of 272 hits, 272 pieces of literature that's extant that exists still where Gar ends a sentence. Okay. 56 writers. Ultimately, when he, when he shows the next table, you see which writers during that, that little narrow period of time, you know, sort of contemporary, contemporary with Mark, at least in that range. Um, ultimately, 56 writers he lists that used this this construction, ending a sentence with Gar. Technically, it's 57, but because um, under, if you can see the tiny print, I apologize for the size of the, I, I didn't make the table, I'm just presenting it to you. It's on his paper, which you can link, which you can find down below and you can read for free with the little JSTOR, uh, just connect your Google account to it or whatever and you'll be fine. Um, but under first century CE, you see where it says the second one on the list, Novum Testamentum. That is just, that just means New Testament. Okay, so remember there's Mark, it happens in Mark, it happens in John. So that's actually two authors, not one. So it's actually 57 authors that use the construction at some point, you know, where they write a sentence that ends that way. Then we get to the interesting stuff. This is table five on his work. And now you don't need to study this table. I'm going to summarize it all for you. I'm going to simplify everything. But what he's done is he, he then groups these, not just by author, but by genre. And he says, hey, look, these on, on the far you know, left of your screen, these are all lists of types of genres like grammatica, right? Doxographa or like philosophy. These are the genres. And then he's, he says, here's how many words are in the genre. Here's how many times gar shows up as the end, at the end of a sentence. And here's how uh, often that happens compared to the number of words. In other words, statistically, how frequently does it happen? This is important because Clayton Croy's argument and many people have echoed this, many, many people, is to say that Mark 16.8 is so statistically unlikely to end with Gar that it didn't. This is pushing back on those statistics a bit. So the next table will show you this is philosophy. Philosophy, there's tons of words of philosophy. Gar appears with a frequency of 0.1459 per 10,000 words. It's rare, it's rare everywhere. Ignore the top one on the list, the Coquirania, uh, Coquinaria. That is an, an anomalous one. It, it doesn't. There's not enough of a sample for it to be st statistically significant, so we can ignore the top one. But the rest of them show you they're all relatively similar in range. Gar appears infrequently all the time. It's always infrequent. It seems as though Clayton Croy was misled by the number of words in philosophy and didn't compare how often it happens, right? So there's more gars in philosophy because there's more philosophy, 2 million words. Now, when you go to um, compare philosophy to narrative with this table, you find these are the results. Narrative, which is multiple genres are in narrative. It does occur somewhat less on average, somewhat less on average, but it's not significant statistically. In one evangelica in that category, you've got it occurring actually a little bit more. Um, in others, you have it occurring a little bit less in, in a, like one, I would say significantly less, but it's still relatively close. Like the point is there isn't this massive statistical difference that we could base a conclusion about the ending of Mark on. So it's not normal. Obviously, Gar appears rarely as the end of a sentence, but it appears and it appears across all kinds of genre. That's the point. Let me give you an example of this. Um, why this kind of argument is like not a good idea to go to the scripture and, and conclude without any evidence of this other ending that's missing, right? To just conclude that there is a missing ending. It's a little bit sketchy. And one of the reasons is 
my anniversary. <laughs> Let me explain. Usually for my anniversary, me and Allison, we've we've been married for 11 years now, right? And usually for our anniversary, we will go out to like a nice restaurant, right? Just somewhere special to sit down and like have a have a nice dinner together and celebrate and give each other cards and stuff like that. One year, because I had been so busy, I go through seasons of being far too busy, <laughs> and uh, and she was tired and I was tired. Like on our anniversary. We ditched our plans to go out somewhere fancy, and we just went to In-N-Out, which is a burger joint in California. Very good burgers, but it's a drive through burger joint, right? Like the first drive through in California. That's why it's called In-N-Out, right? They named it that because they were innovating drive through in the area. And um, classic American burgers. I think they're great. We drove and got In-N-Out for our anniversary. Now, if you did a statistical analysis of our anniversaries, you would be like, you know, Mike and Allison are pretty reliable. They always go somewhere nice to celebrate their wedding anniversary. I think, statistically speaking, they never went to in and out The pictures of that, the story of that, are simply not true. Do you see the problem with using statistical analysis to invalidate what we're looking at in front of us on the page? That's the problem. It's not normal, but it did happen that way. And we thought it was great. We just don't do it every year. <laughs> it was just perfect for where we were at that day at that time. So this is the conclusion Iverson makes on the GAR claim. He says, what the research does affirm is that scholars should use caution in utilizing a final GAR as a basis for postulating a theory of Marx's ending. Barring significant discoveries of new literature, statistical probability and literary parallels, literary parallels provide little direction in this ongoing debate. The use of final GAR from the third century BCE to the second century CE indicates that both theories are possible but it does not render one theory more probable. His point is, this is like a distraction. Like, you don't need to worry about how it ends with Ephabunta Gar, even though everyone I read spends time talking about that issue, and that's why I'm going to address it today, because I want to be able to help people who have, um, have questions. Number five, let's go to number five, the fifth objection to the 16-8 ending. They say, Mark, okay, this is not about Greek, Right? This is just about like structure, the structure of the, 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 um, the literary structure of Mark. Yeah. It says, Mark ending on such a strange and sudden spot where like, for they were afraid, and it ends. It d just doesn't fit ancient ways of ending a narrative. It assumes that modern literary styles of sudden endings are used by ancient authors, or even worse, postmodernist reading methods. Now, let me deal with this one first because I saw this consistently. There are some who, wanted, who want to, um, they want to say that verses 9 through 20 were original and they want to say it, I think, uh, so strongly that they're not careful in their objections to a verse 8 ending. Um, so, like, this is the kind of thing I think you would hear from King James only camps. And I'm not a King James onlyist and I think people who are King James onlyists are greatly... Um, out of focus and their emphasis upon one translation above all causes them to do lots of things that are not healthy in their own life or in the body of Christ towards others and I'd encourage my brothers and sisters who have been part of that camp to start reading stuff from people outside that camp Christians who are just not part of that camp because you're going to start to see that there's some blind spots one of the blind spots is where you look at verse 8 and you go well that's a postmodernist reading where each reader makes up their own meaning so Mark 16, 8 ends, you know, hey, the, you know, the, they were, the women were in fear. Um, uh, you know, the, okay, the angel appears, the tomb is empty, the message goes out, the women are trembling and astonished, and they, and they say nothing to anyone for they're afraid. We put that all in context. I think that's understood now. But they'll say, by not having the appearances, you're then supplying your own meaning. Uh, but this is not postmodernism. Whatever this is, it is not postmodernism. Because postmodernism would say, you read the Bible and you ask not what does it mean, but you ask what does it mean to you. When Mark ends suddenly, we're not supposed to say, and I don't think Mark wants us to, and I don't think anyone's, no one that I would respect is suggesting that we read our own meaning into the end of Mark. Fill in the in the rest. You make up the rest of the story as you want. That is that is the postmodernist thing, right? Which is just let's just pretend that we can invent our own reality. Um, no, instead what we're doing is we're discovering the meaning that Mark intended using the foreshadowing that he's laid out in the book so far. All right. And let me just pause for a second and acknowledge. 
I realize this is a strange way for me to end my study through the Gospel of Mark. So probably me ending this way for the entire Gospel is more strange than Mark ending at verse 8. But I follow the directions of the passage, the debates that are going on in our culture and world today, the questions people have, the things that naturally come up, and often the stuff that you don't hear pastors teaching on. That's the stuff I'm going to focus on more. So here we are. Uh, fitting way to end Mark, in my opinion, <laughs> if, if somewhat ironic. So what we really have to ask is this. Here's the more thoughtful question. Not as a postmodern. That's silly. What we need to ask is this. Do ancient stories ever end suddenly with only predictions, only predictions and a trajectory of the story un, um, of the untold ending, right? Like it's projected forward. And the, re the reader has to fill in the details using the predictions and the foreshadowing. And the answer here is going to be yes. Uh, and this is where Lee Magnus's book comes in, um, marking the end. And he goes through a number of examples of this sort of thing um, where he talks about how, like, say, ancient epics would end. Uh, so I'm not saying Mark is an epic, but I am saying when you look at ancient epics, you realize that readers of Mark's time had the ability, why do I have to defend this? But they had the ability to read between the lines a little bit and see what, what was being hinted at in the text. So um, G.E. Duckworth, according to Magnus, G.E. Duckworth says the following about ancient epics contemporary with Mark. The typical epic, though it must have a close, does not have an end. End instinctively, and instinctively, the supreme epic poets close their work in such a way as to leave us with a vivid sense of going on. You see, it's not like the world the universe just disintegrates at the end of the book. Rather, they've set you up to play out the, the rest of the story or the continuing of the story because they've given you indications throughout the book. So one example of this is the Aeneid by Virgil. 20 BC. So this is, this is again, this is like Mark's alive when this is written because this is contemporary. Um, and it's probably the easiest example for us to discuss. It's a, it's, it's, it has an odd ending, but let me, for those of you who have not read the Aeneid, you don't need to, but the, the hero, Aeneas, he is a guy that's foreshadowed by the to be the founder of Rome. Like this is from the beginning of the book and through the book, it's all about the founding of Rome. This is the ultimate meta narrative that's going on in the story, the founding of Rome. He's a good guy. He's a civilized man. Keep that in mind. Um, now, the book involves Aeneas's travel from the destruction of Troy to overcome various obstacles that will eventually lead to the founding of Rome. Again, this is like the central theme. It ends with a duel. This is how the book ends. Strange ending. With a duel between Aeneas and a guy named Turnus. Turnus is losing the duel, and they do represent different different battles. It, it's like a bigger than just the two of them. They're kind of like representing their armies, which are also fighting. Um, now, Turnus is losing the duel. Turnus begs Aeneas for, for, for mercy, and he begs him in the name of Pallas. Pallas is Aeneas' buddy that Turnus killed. This just triggers Aeneas even more, so Aeneas kills him. Here's how the book ends. The civilized man who's supposed to found Rome. It says, He plunged his sword in fury deep into his enemy's heart. But as for him, his limbs lay slump and chill, and his soul flew resentful of its fate down to the shades with many a sigh and groan. the end <laughs> what are some things that are missing obviously it's like this sort of tense sudden ending but there's also important things that are missing that are key to the story so Aeneas's marriage is not there it's important right it's talked about in the story he is not married it doesn't happen it's foreshadowed but it, doesn't, but it doesn't happen in the story peace with the latins doesn't actually happen it ends in the middle of a battle right? The founding of Rome does not happen. This is probably the most important thing. The, the story says it's about the founding of Rome, but the founding of Rome never happens in this book. There's no new language, new city, new people, all that stuff isn't there. How does this apply to Mark? Well, Aeneas, the, the Aeneid, and, and the story of Aeneas and all that is a, a, an even stronger example of a sudden abrupt ending without major elements happening in the story, but the story is known to the readers. The people who are reading know the rest of the story. They they live, you know, they're Romans. So they know that they're they're able to fill in the details with the stuff they know, as well as the foreshadowing that has been given by the writer of the epic. Well, I would say this does it way more than Mark. Mark gives us doesn't just give us like Jesus going to the cross with the foreshadowing of his resurrection. Jesus dies. He rises again three days later, an angel appears, and his, his, his future appearance, especially in Galilee, is, is foretold. That's how it ends. Like, there's not that much hanging, actually. 
it's not hard for you to see the rest of the story as it plays out here. Um, here's an interesting factoid, though. The Aeneid, while it was intelligently and thoughtfully and intentionally ended abruptly, there are many people who didn't like it, and they actually supplied their own endings. Several different people tried to write a, a fuller ending for the Aeneid. Isn't that interesting to know that? That while it was understood and known and considered thoughtful, not everybody gets it, and some people try to add to the story. I, I think that's pretty interesting because that's kind of something that happened in Mark, although that may be by the leading of the Spirit, for all I know that the content in verses 9 through 20 is comes from the apostles in some way to be there. The point is it wasn't originally. So um, Lee Magnus, uh, J. Lee Magnus offers a number of other examples that support, and this is really important, two things. The ability of ancient authors to employ a truncated or sudden ending and the ability of ancient audiences to work out the rest of the story for themselves using the foreshadowing and the, and the stuff that the author had already written. So if they can do it with these things, they can do it with Mark 16, 8. That's my only point. You can refer to pages 36 and 37 in Magnus's slightly strange and somewhat helpful book. <laughs> it's not as helpful as you think it's going to be, but there is some stuff in there. Um, there's also a number of biblical books. I'm going to race through some examples from scripture of books that have hanging endings. Because if you are one of those who's hung up on the idea that Mark can't hang up <laughs> on verse 8, just track with me that this actually happens in scripture in a number of places. So Jonah is the main character in the book of Jonah, right? And the book traces his attitude. God tells him to, to go and he's like, I'm not going to go. And he runs the other way and then he, finally he yields and he's like, okay, I'll go. And he goes and he preaches and the Ninevites, they repent and Jonah gets all bitter and upset. Um, God rebukes him at the end of the book. Here's how Jonah ends. And it does end a little strangely if you're expecting everything to be... Um, almost like children's storybook endings, but it's not. So Genesis, uh, Jonah chapter four, verses 10 and 11. Here's the end of the book. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. And then it ends. Like, sit with that for a minute. You're hungry for more. You want more. But by not giving you more, Jonah forces you to look back at what, what you've been given. The book forces you to reread the last passage and to realize that there's a lesson here that you might miss if it, if it tightly and cutely finished off all the story. There's no word about Jonah. There's no word about his attitude. Did Jonah repent? Did he go home? He's It's like the camera zooms out. Jonah's grumpy on a hill. <laughs> like that's the end of Jonah. You know, the VeggieTales movie of Jonah um, and the whale, right? The Jonah the Big Fish. I forget the title of it. The um, the movie is, the, the theme song is Jonah was a prophet, but he really never got it. Not the most satisfying of theme songs, actually. And... Um, Here's what it leaves us with. When you stop and reflect on the sudden and unexpected ending, when you stop and think, you get this. God cares about these wicked people. Do you? Do you care more about your creature comforts than you do about the people around you that are perishing without the gospel of Christ? This is where it leaves us hanging. It personalizes it. I realize that I could be like Jonah too, one who has the message and doesn't want to bother because I'm, I just don't care. And then I care more about my internet going out. I care more about my my whatever, my comforts, my creature comforts falling away from my life is, is irritates me more, motivates me more than the salvation of my neighbors, my 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 coworkers, my friends, my family. Um, and wow, that that's a powerful and convicting in a very positive way, convicting thing. Song of Solomon also has a has a slightly strange ending you might not notice. And this is because um, it's all about the anticipation of a wedding and a relationship, of, of the consummation of it, and yet it doesn't happen. It ends with a call for them to be joined together. They're calling to one another, the man and the woman. But they don't actually consummate the marriage, at least not as in my understanding of Song of Solomon. So there's another example of kind of like it just ends there. And by ending there, it forces us to think about that tension of the the, the wonder and the danger of, of romantic longing but it also then becomes something we can we can see the picture of Christ in the church that's there and that we're waiting on that future uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. So there's, there's beautiful stuff that's there, but it's achieved by not giving us the rest. 
There's other New Testament books that do this too. And But before I move on, let me just acknowledge, Mark, as he's writing, he's aware of these Old Testament works. They're in his mind. The culture he's aware of is understanding that truncated or sudden endings are a thing, and we can see how they work to emphasize things that we might otherwise miss. So um, let's talk about the ascension a little bit. The ascension of Jesus. Um, only Luke in the Gospels, right? at least initially, only Luke is the, is the one that actually talks about the ascension of Jesus. Yet the ascension is a pretty essential element in the gospel of Christ, right? It's, it's important that Jesus ascended. Matthew doesn't talk about it, but he foreshadows it. Now, my point here is going to be this. Matthew foreshadows important theological things he doesn't discuss in detail. He doesn't narrate. Mark does this too, right? He, he foreshadows and discusses the appearances. He just doesn't describe them while they happen, doesn't narrate them. Matthew 16, 27 it says, for the Son of Man is going to come in glory, in the glory of the fa- of his Father and with his angels, and then will re- and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Now, if Jesus is going to come in glory with his, with the angels, then he obviously has to ascend. Do you see that? They're going to see him coming in his kingdom. Um, so, uh, actually, the next thing there that happens is the transfiguration. For those who are like, wait, what? Yeah, I did a study on that not too long. <laughs> talked about that every once in a while actually but Matthew 24 30 is another example of this uh, then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will what see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory so this is a coming of Christ from heaven Matthew's foreshadowing the ascension even though he's not directly talking about it it has to happen he does this in 2541 and in 2664 as well John does this too. He foreshadows, he discusses the ascension actually even more clearly than uh, Matthew does, but he doesn't actually talk about it happening. John 6, 62. What then if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? How about John 13, 1? Now before the feast of the Passover, John knowing that his, uh, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. But what's he going to do? He's going to depart out of this world to the Father. This is the ascension that is discussing. In John 16.10, we have another passage. John 16.10 says, And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no longer. John 20.17, we have it again. Think of how much John's talking about this. He talked about it a lot. Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go and tell my brethren, right, that what? I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God, showing our relationship with God secured by Jesus. But the ascension is clearly very important in in the gospel of John, but it's never narrated. If you read the ending of John, the last, you know, the the camera zooms out, so to speak, at, at Galilee in a conversation Jesus is having with the disciples, right? It doesn't talk about the ascension. But it does talk about the ascension. It just doesn't narrate it. So we see this in the in the Gospels. They discuss things. They foreshadow things that they don't always narrate later on. That's important for those who ob- object to um, Mark's ending. In Acts 28, we also have a very interesting... I remember the first time I read Acts as like a, um, a young guy, a whippersnapper. And I, I like read and I got to the end of Acts and I was like... But that's the end? Like, I just felt like, probably a lot of people do, like, what? I don't want that to be the end. I want to know what happens next. I really want to know what happens to Paul. And we never find out. But let me read to you. Paul has appealed to Caesar. People want to kill him. He's trying to stay safe just by appealing to Caesar. But he's effectively imprisoned during that time. He's finally made it to Rome and he's waiting. And in verse 30 it says, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching Concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, with all openness, unhindered. See, he can't. He's kind of on house arrest, right? But they can come to him, and they and he preaches to them. Then it ends. What happens after two years? In in, in the book of Acts, like what happens? Some have actually said that Acts. Oh, I didn't put it on your screen. Sorry. There you go. Some have actually said that Act doesn't really end this way. That like Luke must have planned a sequel, or maybe Luke was writing and he died. But I think, again, we're just, like, just read it as it is. <laughs> What's so wrong with just reading it as it is? It's what we have in, before us. So I think it's brilliant. And some people would agree. The gospel progress in the book of Acts is not as much about Paul as it is about the gospel. 
The gospel has progressed throughout the empire. It's now made it to Rome. And here, Acts leaves us with this tension. Even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of uncertainty about the future fate of the apostles, like Paul, the gospel goes out unhindered. The gospel, even in the midst of that persecution, does go out freely and people are getting saved. That is brilliant. That is a message for us today. We're not just going to obsess about the fate of Paul. We need to apply it to our lives and say, I'm going to carry this gospel forward, Lord. I'm going to trust you in the midst of troubles and persecutions, and you're going to be able to open doors for me to share the truth. We don't just, with Mark, it's the same way. I don't just isolate myself to the women in verse 8. I look at the trajectory of the story, right? Jesus has risen. The monumentous meaning of the resurrection is just embedded in the eyes of the women as they're shaking with the weight of it all. And there they flee. There they go from the tomb in fear, positive fear, telling nothing to anyone on the way as they go to the disciples to speak of Jesus' certain appearance that will happen at least in Galilee. And there's other appearances we know about as well. So it's definitely possible for ancient authors to do this. Some people say Mark's not sophisticated enough. I think that's a strange and silly thing to say. His Greek is second language, but that doesn't mean he's a dummy. English might be your second language. That doesn't mean you're a dummy. Um, Mark shows lots of signs of sophistication throughout his writing, um, as I've already demonstrated through 70 weeks of studying the Gospel of Mark. All right, let's look at objection number six <laughs> in very unconventional study we're doing of Mark. Mark's foreshadowing tells us what his original ending would have contained. This won't take too long to discuss, but Mark's foreshadowing tells us what he originally would have had in his ending, and that would have been an appearance to G of Jesus in Galilee. So from verse 7 in particular, Mark 16, 7, the angel just straight up says, like, he's going before you. You'll see him in Galilee. Tell his disciples this. And Peter, uh, this, which is a very abrupt way to speak of the restoration of Peter after he denied Jesus. Mark's saving space. So he's going to Galilee, and you'll see him. Um, that's the message to the, to the disciples. There's going to be a group appearance in Galilee, a planned appearance. This is probably the same appearance that 1 Corinthians 15 talks about, where it says over 500 brethren at once. I think it's very likely that the 500 at once was this appearance in Galilee because it's the only appearance of Jesus that was pre-planned that we're aware of. He appears to the, on the road to Emmaus. They weren't expecting him. He appears in the, in the, in the inner room. They weren't expecting him there. He appears uh, in, the, in the garden just to Mary. She wasn't looking, expecting him, looking for him there. So these appearances are unexpected, but the, but the 500 at once, it seems likely that there was a, an intentional gathering of, of people, and that may have been the Galilee appearance. Interesting thing to think about. Um, so some people try to actually say, look, there's a Galilee appearance Mark talks about. Obviously, the original ending of Mark would have included, after verse 8, an appearance in Galilee. That would have happened in Mark. But here's the pushback we'll have on this. The scholars who do this, who say they can reconstruct, some have actually even written it out. They're like, immediately, they have to use the word immediately, because right? that's Mark. And then they write out like what they think it would have said. What they're telling us is that we can read from the earlier parts in Mark what happens after Mark ends. And to me, this is just evidence that a verse 8 ending is satisfactory. If you can predict what would have happened next, then that doesn't mean Mark had to have written it. It means Mark has already told you what happened next even if it's not narrated specifically. Another um, support for this could be Mark 1. So Mark ends abruptly. I admit that. It ends before you want it to. I admit that. Doesn't mean it ends before it was supposed to. <laughs> but Mark also begins that way. And the fact that Mark begins that way, unlike all the other Gospels, ends, it begins abruptly, begins suddenly, but just throws you right into the middle of the action. The fact that he does that Maybe evidence for the fact that he ended that way as well. So Mark chapter 1. Let's just read a section of scripture here. Take in like how much you're supposed to already know. Like he doesn't explain how much, you know, contextually he doesn't give you at this moment in the beginning. Just like he in the ending just ends. So Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. 
and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, after me, one is coming who's mightier than I, and I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son. In you, I'm well pleased. Immediately, the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John had been taken into custody, do you see how fast the story's moving? How many things are not explained? Where is Jesus coming from? How long has John been doing this? Where does John come from? Mark skips things that other gospel authors do include because Mark's not writing the same as they do. The other gospel authors include things like the birth of Jesus, the birth of John, genealogies. Uh, John, the gospel of John starts in the beginning at creation. So we have... Um, basically a mirror between the ending and the beginning of Mark that shows similarity that's there that we we can we can acknowledge. Another way Mark's ending at verse 8 makes sense is this. And this is a good theological point. Those of who've been with me for 70 weeks of studying the gospel of Mark verse by verse, thoughtfully, carefully, methodically, you have seen how much Mark, even more so than the other gospels, emphasizes the cross of Christ. They all emphasize it, don't get me wrong, more so though. Mark has a really strong emphasis on how, how Jesus is undoing false messianic expectations that have them believing that the Messiah is coming, but being confused about what he's there to do. He wants people to know he has to die for our sins, not just overcome uh, the obstacles in our life, right? Not just bring prosperity to you. He's going to save your soul from sin. Jesus is going to be the sacrifice for all that you've ever done wrong to restore you to God. To bring you not just a better, better temporal life, but full eternal life. This is a massive emphasis in Mark, Jesus' death as sacrifice for our sins. Okay, that being said, he does this more so than the other Gospels. When he ends on the empty tomb with the resurrection and then just stops, it kind of forces you to look at the resurrection as commentary on the, on the, uh, on the cross. The resurrection is the final comment on the death of Jesus, that he dies for our sins and he conquers death and you're left with the weight of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Has that ever hit you? How powerful the fact of the resurrection of Jesus is? It's not a Christian storybook thing. It's a devastatingly powerful fact of reality that changes everything. The abrupt ending keeps Mark's focus on the cross because the resurrection is now commentary on Jesus successfully defeating death. So Mark is a bit different than the other gospels in another important way. Um, this is kind of cool. I've loved this going through Mark. It's been super enjoyable and satisfying and like hopefully for you too. As we've been going through Mark and we see that Mark often doesn't tell us what to believe about Jesus. He gives you events that tell you what to believe about Jesus. Like he doesn't directly say it. He, he gives you the events that lead to the conclusions. And so the readers have to put it together themselves, right? Mark does it all the time where, you know, Jesus walks on water and they're like, who is this? You know, where Jesus calms the storm and they're like, who is this that could calm the storm? Jesus casts out a demon. They're like, who is this that could cast out a demon? And Mark kind of looks at you as the reader and goes like, eh? Do you get it? Who he is? He walks on the water. He calms the storm. He casts out the demons with a word. He, huh? Eh? He forgives sins. Huh? Like Mark is looking at you, gives you all the all the evidence that you need to work it out, and then says, huh? And I feel like the end of Mark does the same thing. Like he looks at you and goes, He rose from the dead? Huh? Like you. Do you realize the power and the glory and the and the identity of who this person is? The real true Messiah. He's greater than you thought, and he's doing something better than you thought. Um, so Dan Wallace has said that. If this is Mark's intention, if Mark intends to leave you like, huh? Like, you know, the way he's done with his other miracle stories, other stories of Jesus doing powerful things, then it may be appropriate that he ends with gar, which is not an impossible word, but a strange word, a sudden way to end the text. So here's what Dan Wallace says in uh, the perspectives on the ending of Mark book, chapter one. He says, of all the gospels, Mark tends to leave to the reader, leave it to the reader to form an opinion about Jesus. <clears throat> 
rather than telling the reader what he must believe. Throughout his gospel, the disciples are asking, who is this man? And the reader is drawn into the story, sitting in the boat with the disciples, wrestling with the same questions. Mark wants them to work things out for themselves, not in an academic detached way, but by coming to grips with Jesus of Nazareth. And how beautiful that Mark ends with you having to come to grips with the resurrection of Christ and just sit with that. That's the ending of Mark. Man, it's it's good stuff. So um, there's one more objection we're going to cover. Before that, I'll say uh, some people say that when Mark has predictions or foreshadowing, he always fulfills them. This is a rule I've heard. It's like there's a lot of rules that people are trying to put on Mark that I don't think they should. Um, when Mark narrates something when he t- or when he predicts something, he always narrates it later. But here's some quick examples I was able to think of. Uh, James and John, Jesus says they'll be drinking the cup. In other words, they'll experience a lot of suffering like Jesus has, but Mark never narrates that. Okay, um, the disciples being brought before rulers, Mark never narrates that, but it does talk about that. Uh, Mark 13 has a whole chapter about future events, the whole chapter that Mark never narrates. Okay, so that's not that's not like a rule for Mark. If I, if I foreshadow it, I have to write about it later. Um, that's kind of weird. So we have a verse 8 ending, and the verse 8 ending actually makes a lot of sense and actually makes the, the, verse, the, the book very powerful, in my opinion, and the message very weighty. All right, last objection. Mark or any gospel cannot properly end without appearances of Jesus being, quote, narrated. There's got to be a narration, not just appearances, but a narration of appearances. I've heard this from a number of people, and I think that it's also, um, why are we making up these rules? First, Mark is the first gospel, most likely, right? Probably the first gospel written. Like, what rule is he conforming to? (laughs) As he writes the first, the first gospel, you know, you can't end, you have to end it this way, Mark. It's like, this is the first one. Like, what do you mean? Um, so the early church preaching though, did always talk about the appearances of Jesus and the early preaching it's, it's enshrined, right? They talk about the appearances all the time, the witnesses. Also the other gospels, the other three do include narrated appearances of Jesus, but the Ascension, which I've already talked about helps push back on the power of this argument because the ascension is also a very important part of the preaching of the early church. Look at the book of Acts. The ascension matters. It it, it matters theologically. It even made it into one of the early church creeds. First Timothy 3.16. This is a creed of the early church. It's the way it's structured. It's, It's a creed, an early creed. Kind of cool to think about that, right? That Jesus was what? Revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, and taken up in glory. Again, that passive sense because it's it's about there's a theological commentary in the ascension of Christ. So that's part of the creed that's there. But yet three of the gospels don't narrate the ascension. They foreshadow it, but they don't narrate it. That's interesting, isn't it? Okay, so maybe that rule doesn't work. You can't just demand that Mark end his gospel a certain way. Um, some people will go so far, like Richard Carrier, of, of saying that the lack of narrated appearances of Jesus in Mark is a serious problem for Christianity because if the earth, and here's how the logic goes, if the earliest gospel doesn't have narr and they, they really lean on this word, notice it, narrated appearances of Jesus, then maybe they didn't happen. <laughs> maybe there were later legendary editions. There's a thousand problems with this, um, but one of them is going to be that the Gospels aren't our earliest source for the appearances of Jesus. The speeches in Acts have Semiticisms that push them back very early. They talk about appearances. But 1 Corinthians is probably our earliest account. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, right? It's, it's written in the 50s, but the data in 1 Corinthians 15, I've talked about this a few times, so I won't go into detail. Scholars agree this information goes back to like, within seven years, within, could be two years, could be one year, could be right away, within seven years of the resurrection of Jesus. The earliest appearance accounts are he appeared to Peter, he appeared to James, he appeared to the 12, he appeared to all the apostles. Then finally, Paul's like, then he appeared to me, finally. He also appeared to 500 at once. This is 1 Corinthians 15. If people want to act like the appearances of Jesus are late, that they're a late addition to Christianity or to the message of the church, this is just it's just not true. And to try to hang this on Mark ending abruptly, and Mark does mention appearances, he just doesn't narrate them. This is just word games. And this is what I hear, especially from guys like, say, Bart Ehrman in debate. He'll play with the word narrate. Well, there's no narration of, of the resurrection. No narration of it. But you're, you're realizing it's still taught. It's just not narrated. It, 
Okay, this is just word games. You guys can just move along. Now I want to ask this question. Imagine you're in the first century. You are in the early church. You're reading the Gospel of Mark. You're sitting. At, at, what impact does it have on you? Let's picture this and let's let it have this impact on us, I hope. So here's the scene. The public reading of scripture would have happened not with you having your own copy of Mark, but would have probably happened in a community meeting where somebody picks up and they read from a scroll or a little bit later a codex of book form. They read the gospel of Mark in public. This happens in a community. Elders are present. Leaders in the church are there. And keep in mind that eyewitnesses of the resurrection traveled all over the place to go and tell people that they were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. When Paul mentions them in 1 Corinthians 15, he mentions the 500 as though they're still accessible to people in Corinth. Okay, so they traveled around, it seems. So here's the scene. Mark's gospel's read in a local gathering. It ends with the resurrection of Jesus and with this shaking awareness of the women who are just like, what does it mean? It's kind of like the, the thing that they're sitting with. What does this mean? And the next thing that happens is the room is just pregnant with expectation. And I think probably what happened is somebody stood up and said, I was there. I was there when, when, when in Galilee he did appear. And I saw him with my own eyes. I even got to touch him. Here's, here's what happened. Someone else stands up and goes, my dad was there. My, uh, my, or I, I heard Peter when he came to our church and visited and he told us the story. Let me tell you what he told me. I think that there was such a, a living witness of the resurrection going on in the earliest stages that Mark's gospel would have handed it off to those living witnesses very quickly and easily. Now, um, in ancient contexts, people respected eyewitness testimony more than they respected written works. Generally speaking, they preferred to hear someone say, I was there, I saw this, than to read about it being written. That makes it understandable that what Mark does at the end of his book is he hands it off to the local Christian community to reinforce the witness of the resurrection with their living memories of having seen Christ or having heard from those who did. I think that that could be what happened initially in Mark, and it may explain why the longer ending shows up later on. Verses 9 through 20 come in a little bit later in church history as those witnesses are a little bit further back and people are like, hey, you know, maybe there's a faithful elder. This is perhaps a th theory. It could be the case. There's a, a, an elder in the local church who's like, I, you know, I heard from Peter or I heard from Thomas. I heard from the apostles. Let me just write a summary of what we would normally say uh, during these public readings of Mark and, and I'll add it there at the end. Uh, maybe apostolic and then according to the will of God, perhaps. Uh, so the, that's why I still want it in my Bible, even if I don't think it was originally part of the ending. So now you're here. You're at the end of Mark, and here's I just one last question for you, and I'm going to close 70 weeks of, of, of studies. <laughs> um, Mark ends with a focus on the impact of the resurrection on the women. They are, as I understand it, they are in fear in a proper sense, seeing the weight of the meaning of the resurrection of Christ. They're trembling with excitement and astonishment at what has just happened. Like those moments in your life where something so big was going down that you were literally shaking. Has the resurrection ever done this to you? Have you ever been brought to your knees by the cross of Christ? Have you ever been brought to shaking by the realization of the vivid reality that Jesus, God with us, took your sins on the cross, died for all that we've done wrong, and then physically rose from the dead so that we could take our fear of death and cast it away and have a holy fear of God that brings us to a place where we realize everything's different now. Everything's changed. He has risen indeed. And this is the most important fact of reality. The most important thing in my life is to know this and to go and tell other people about it. That's how Mark, I think, leaves us leaves us realizing the impact of the resurrection. So some of you have been raised in Christian homes or you've approached Christianity merely as like an intellectual pursuit. Maybe you, you, you've kind of like have too much of the children's ministry version of Christianity in your mind and you're really growing now and you're moving to a place of going, this is like real. It's real. It's supposed to change my life. It has to change my life. It's, it's so important. Like, how come no one knows how important this is? Like, this should hit you. It should blow you away. It should change the way you live your life. Jesus has come. He has died. He has risen. And this sh should shake us in the best way. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you for the beautiful gospel of Mark, for the brilliance of your word and for the work of your Holy Spirit, that even as we read these things, as we think about these things, you're doing work in us. You're changing us, transforming us, drawing some people who are not believers to the truth of Christ, helping believers to just be shaken in a wonderful way by the reality of the resurrection. We pray, Lord, that we would be those who stand at the tomb and see the weight of it all so that we could go preach the gospel to the world, so that we could do so with a sense of uh, excitement, uh, a sense of awareness of how important it all is. And we pray, God, that you would, you would use us for your glory. We pray that you'd remind us that we're on a mission here in this world, that we should seek first your kingdom and your righteousness above all, all else, and that you'll provide. We pray, God, that you would glorify yourself in our lives through us being true and good witnesses to the truth of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being with me. That was fun. <laughs> Going through the Gospel of Mark. I have never spent, if I could just mention a couple of things real quick, I've never spent so much time in study going and doing a verse-by-verse -verse teaching because um, really my focus has shifted in ministry, doing online stuff pretty much entirely now. Um, that's allowed me basically to spend almost all my time behind the scenes just studying. And I'm really excited to do this. And I think the benefit of this ministry of Bible Thinker is going to be coming from the hours of prep that go in. And in the future content I do, I'm going to continue putting in a great amount of preparation, a great amount of time, a lot of hours of work, because I just feel like, you know, if, if I can put in 20, 60, whatever hours to teach one study, it's going to bring the gems and the jewels of all that prep to people who would never be able to spend all that time week after week after week. So you're enabling me to do something that hopefully will serve you and bless you, strengthen you, help you learn to think biblically. I actually talked to somebody uh, last night at this, at, this, at this study, and they were mentioning how they'd been consuming a lot of the Bible Thinker content, a lot of the teaching and stuff like that, and they'd, they'd realized they, they weren't just getting learning more answers to questions. They were getting better at reading verses in context. And this got me so excited. That is so exactly what this is about, right? Like you're you're not just getting information, you're getting a tool set, I hope, God willing, to learn to think biblically, to process scripture, to work through it, so that you could look and go, I hear Mike on that, but I, I think he missed a point here in the context. And like you're getting to that point, right? Where you're like, no, I'm letting the scripture guide and direct me here. I'm not just memorizing Mike's answers. Oh man, that's a beautiful thing. I hope that's the impact it has on you. And, um, and yes, if, if you had at all been intending to come to my Sunday night service, don't, <laughs> for now at least. So we are um, on hiatus. What I'm doing now is I'm not going to be doing regular weekly Monday videos. I'll do the Friday Q&As every week, every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, Q&As, answering your guys' questions. But I'm going to go on, a, a, I'm not taking a vacation, I'm, I'm going on a study focus season, a research project on the topic of women in ministry. That's the next thing I'm launching into. There's a few other things I'll try to do on the side and weave in and, in and out here there because there's several things I've, been, I've had on the back burner for a long time that I want to cover. But the main focus right now is a big, long, thorough study on women in ministry. I'm going to take as long as it takes. I don't know if it's a month. I don't know if it's two months. I don't know if it's 10 years. Okay, it's not going to be 10 years. But I'm going to take as long as it takes to really thoroughly understand this and answer the hard questions in detail. God help me. I appreciate your prayers. This is to me a very relevant question and one where a lot of believers, they're not like shaking their fist at the Bible. You better change to fit my culture. They're really just going, I just want to understand it rightly and follow it well and serve Jesus in my life properly. Those are the people I'm doing this for. And we're going to do our best to uh, get to those answers. So thank you all very much. Lord bless you. Keep you, make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you, give you peace. And I will see you on Friday.